um, what I have here is um, like a, um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, show that um, encapsulates the last 30 years or so of my work. As, um, um, <coughs> On, on the uh, um, my interest um, along the way and technical developments that happened. The first um, sound art piece that I made was the um, metal skirt sound sculpture. This um, piece uh, had uh, guitar strings from the edge of the skirt down to the toes and heels of my shoes, and was activated uh, simply through walking. Um, when I stepped forward, the string on the back stretched out and produced a, a rising bliss. The front string squeezed in, produced a, a descending bliss. But the same thing was happening in the opposite, opposite way on the other leg. So um, uh, I have a video here of uh, myself performing this piece. <laughs> Produces a tone. Um, the the uh, bucket there, the uh, bowl, was uh, amplified. Um, and here, a uh, slightly more complex installation where the strings are actually tuned, and I'm tuning with these C clamps here, these off the shelf C clamps. This is my first installation uh, in the Terminal New York show. It's a show of 600 artists in Brooklyn uh, uh, from the Williamsburg kind of. Uh, you know, uh, neighborhood, and uh, I built my instrument, uh, I just built a wooden box because uh, I wanted to uh, to have an acoustic sound, and here's a, an idea of what it sounded like. Um, But um, in a sense, it's like a, it was like a theremin for me. It was just uh, these were the first sounds that I made, and it was very exploratory. I felt like I could sound magically, like kind of like a, a chamber ensemble, just by moving my arms on these strings. But um, at the same time, it was very unmanageable, which this video shows. Um, there's that nice sound, but. So this project has been kind of a wild beast that I've been trying to tame all these years, working on timbre. Uh, this is a spread here um, showing uh, um, 
the discovery or the um, description of this phenomenon by uh, John Tyndall and his book Sound. This was published at the turn of the century as an English theorist, and this diagram here is showing that when a string is um, played in longitudinal mode, that is when the stroke along the length, um, it produces a tone. And this is showing like divide, how the string divides up into um, various modes uh, and produces overtones. Um, and the method of tuning a string, which is played in the longitudinal mode, is uh, taking the speed of the wave divided by the length to uh, find the frequency, or vice versa, frequency. Uh, speed of the wave divided by the frequency will give the string length at which you'll get that, that tone. And that's how I, I have a spreadsheet. And I uh, work out my tuning system um, that way. But this is, this is uh, one of my first compositions. It's a duet. And uh, what it is is a, a sequence of chords. It's just uh, chord changes. And I had to find another way of uh, uh, of creating notation because uh, standard notation makes no sense uh, on on an instrument which can be played um, with uh, very long duration. Um, it's kind of the the bowing stroke is really like the entire length of the string, so it's that that takes minutes. To, uh, uh, and um, so I really couldn't uh, use standard notation. Um, had to describe uh, time in a different way, and I decided to, to describe time by distance walked. This um, is showing a sequence of chord changes, uh, and I'm, I'm tuning in just intonation, which is a numerically based system based on the overtone series. Um, so this is a duet, and the first box in the top left corner is, that's uh, the top line is my part, the one below it is, is my colleague Arnold Dreiblatt uh, played this with me, and we what we did was um, we began at the uh, wooden resonator box bridge and walked together, and it was a sequence of chords where we walked together in unison, in and out, and that was um, that was the only way I could come up with knowing how to track the parts uh, was to just do it again. So uh, the next idea I had was that when one performer walked out, the other one walked in. And so that this way we could watch each other and track. And then as uh, one person uh, was changing to a new chord, that, that gap of silence was covered over by the other performance. So this made a smoother um, kind of transition. But again, you know, this is very simple as far as composition goes, and I wanted to I wanted to be able to do more complex things. I saw this piece of Guadalajara fabric and I thought that looks like music. It looks these geometric repeated shapes um, to me uh, looked like minimalist music with repeating parts. And I created this notation system where I placed colored lines on the floor that were at proportionate lengths to each other. And there in the notation I could um, make trend transitions occur um, like at proportionate uh, uh, length of time. And so you see here at the, uh, this blue line uh, is twice as long as the yellow. So this person moving to the yellow plays two different chords while the blue line is just sustaining this during the entire time. And then I could, I was able to create, you know, more, more complicated ways of um, harmonic motion. We have a video of this piece.
Greeks um, was a really high, uh, high point for me um, to work with that ensemble. Uh, but I began to feel that um, uh, there, I wanted to uh, find a way to articulate dynamics with this instrument. If you notice, like, our um, tone was always um, as loud as possible. And if you were there and could hear this over a big sound system, it was uh, very loud. Um, and the, the tone, if we were always uh, at the highest possible dynamic range, that was simply because I didn't know how to change dynamics. I didn't know how to play softly. Um, I wasn't able to get a, a nice tone quality um, at a soft level or just touching it very lightly. It took, um, it took me actually years of practice um, to be able to do that. And I became dissatisfied with, with, that, with the technique from that era and, and set out um, to um, come up with, with um, articulations of, and dynamics for this instrument and uh, different, different styles of playing it. Um, this piece, um, this, this is a slide of a, a duet that I uh, performed in 89. And while we were recording this, um, a train uh, passed by. And um, um, I'm going to play an excerpt of this on the train. by the complexity of that sound harmonically, and I wanted to be able to compose that. I wanted uh, the, the composition, uh, my composition was very, um, very uh, straightforward uh, harmonically. And when that train came through, you know, it was a major inspiration. Um, I really love the, um, the expressivity of the, the dissonance that, that occurred there. This slide um, shows a, a, a comparison of my instrument with the cello. My instrument is, is the yellow and a cello is blue. Um, we're, both, we're both playing um, A, concert A, uh, 440. And um, the uh, cello and long string instrument um, in the lower frequency range, which is you know like at the fundamental level, um, are nearly matched. But you see like up in the um, higher range, up in the upper partials, the long string instrument partials are very strong um, all the way up. And up here is like so called beyond the uh, range of hearing, which is um, like up in 40K, you still see very evenly spiked partials. Um, so the, the, um, you might not get a sense of this from my presentation today, but my, all of my work and concerns are, uh, in, in my music are up here in this range, which we can't really you know, get too much of a sense of with the, with the, with the sound system here. But um, working with, with partials and overtones. Uh, strings, as I said before, um, vibrate simultaneously at, in different modes all at once. And so 
So if you're playing, say, an A, all of these other notes are, you know, compounded in that sound of A. And in my instrument, all of these partials are very, very strongly pronounced. What I did was I created this, uh, this is, this, this is an, like an elastic band that I uh, marked up uh, with uh, divisions of the entire length of the band representing these different partials. So if I started at the bridge of the resonator and then stretched out the uh, elastic to any length, my instrument's tuned by length, and I can stretch it out and hook it on to the capo, and that marks out a uh, map of the, um, the partials. I, I use that when I'm composing. I can, I can locate different partials along the length as I'm walking. And this is kind of a vis visualization of that idea where this is the resonator box. I'm using, instead of colored lines, numbers on the floor at metric divisions. And these graphics represent the partials and You'll see that in some places, like here, the blue is at the same as the as the pink, and like this is the, this is an octave here. But um, so as I'm walking, I can see these. If I'm playing a chord, I can see the alignments in, in and here as well. This is a um, score using the numbers on the floor to choreograph my. Uh, sequence um, because the, sound, the, the timbre or timbral changes along the, the length of the uh, string. And so uh, these numbers on the top here are the pitches that I'm playing, and then, then I have kind of a uh, uh, icons which describe articulations. And um, so this is my, my most complex um, composition to date. And um, I have a little video of it using spike cams mounted on my wrist um, to show the more um, micro gestures that occur as I, as I fly. another way of articulating percussively my instrument. I created this um, tool, the box bow, and have these um, graphics which represent different gestures. And I uh, came up with this uh, notation. This is in 4-4 time. Placed those graphics within a grid. And uh, I'll show you what that sounds like. Uh, part, which is D, 